Good morning, everybody. Take your Bibles. Let's turn to Psalm 63 one more time. Psalm 63. Janet, thank you for filling in for Teresa. Pray for Dan. Okay, thank you, Robert. Pray for Dan and his little girl, uh, Shiloh. They're both under the weather. And let's see. Also pray, I got a text on the way here from Stephen Clem. Not Stephen, I'm sorry. Jonathan Clem. And he said, oh, Pastor Bob, please have everybody pray for me. I woke up and I'm so sick. And I said, okay, we can do that. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. So... All right, well, let's jump right into this. We've been doing this series on our devotional life, our hungering and thirsting for God for two Sundays now, and this will be the last message. And we're going to look at Dirk Nowitzki. Yeah, all right, yes. Oh, you're not clapping. You don't know who he is. All right, yeah, all right. All right. He's been in Dallas for 21 years now. He came out of Würzburg, Germany. And uh, he was, uh, went through high school, was a phenomenal high school basketball player. So great, seven foot tall, 18 years old. He came straight out of high school to Dallas and played ball in the NBA. That's amazing. I would say that he would have to be on probably in the top 10 best basketball players that have ever lived. Again, I'm biased on that, so I would put him in the top 10. He's got, he's got the sixth, he's number six on the list of the most points ever scored in the NBA. And so that's super impressive, number six. I mean, that's incredible. Like I said, he grew up in Germany. How many great games did we get to see over those 21 years? Dirk Nowitzki, Kobe Bryant, and Tim Duncan of the San Antonio Spurs. All of them are going to be in the Hall of Fame. You know, just, just write it down. They're all going to the Hall of Fame one day. They're amazing. Uh, when he was growing up in Germany, now here's Dirk when he came to Dallas. Did you see that? <laughs> Last year? 20 years ago, 21 years ago, he's 18. Anyway, um, when he was growing up in Germany, now this is when he was in Dallas, but that's, I couldn't find another picture of his coach. When he was growing up in Germany, he spent hours and hours of time with his coach, whose name is Holger Gerswindler. Okay, I took German last year, so I can talk like I'm really no German, you know, but anyway, anyway, his coach Holger, he practiced layups. He practiced free throws. He practiced three-point shots. He spent so much time. He allowed his coach to give him tips on how to become a better player so he could be the best that he could be. All right? There's no doubt in my mind that Dirk Nowitzki's self-discipline. You know, some of the greatest players were that way. Larry Bird, Michael Jordan. They spent hours and hours every day perfecting. You know, like Dirk Nowitzki, all those years, I think his, he ended up having a free throw percentage that was like 91% or something like that. And every, every 100 free throws he shot, he would make 90 of them. And that was his whole career. I mean, that's unbelievable. But it's because of this. He had self-discipline, okay? He was teachable. Self-discipline means, like, for instance, the Bible says this. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself, okay? God's calling you to do that. God's not going to do it for you. You've got to say, hey, for instance, you discipline yourself if you have a daily job. You don't say, hey, you know what? I know they want me to be there at 7 a.m., but you know what? I'm just going to come in when I feel like it. No, you discipline yourself. You say, listen, I can't go to bed at 12 o'clock at night if I'm going to be sitting at a desk at 7 a.m. I've got to go to bed early. That's why I yell and scream at God's people. Don't stay up till 2 in the morning on Saturday night playing video games. 
because you're going to come in like a zombie on Sunday morning. You're going to come in and you're not going to, you're going to fall asleep five minutes after I start my message. You're going to be over there. And then I'll have to yell at you. <laughs> Wake up. And so you get the idea. Self-discipline says, you know what? Um, I have to take it upon myself to be around my coach. And of course, we're talking capital C coach, right? God as our coach. Dirk Nowitzki said, Holger, come to the gym and be with me there so you can teach me things and give me tips and help me to be my very best. Well, that's why God wants us to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. He wants us to be our very best for him. You know what, I, I don't want to hear, and I know you don't either, I don't want to stand before Jesus one day and just, you know, hear him say something like, well, Bob, you know what, um, not too bad. <laughs> that wouldn't be very encouraging for me because all my life I've been preaching to you that I want to hear and I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear something like, Medio You're, you were mediocre, you know, I definitely don't want to hear this. Bob, you were a wicked and lazy servant. Now, some Christians are going to hear, you wicked and lazy servant. Whoa. Wow. I definitely don't want to hear that. And um, so, anyway, Dirk went on, I mean, in 2011. Oh, what a great year that was. We almost won it all in 2006. But then the, the Miami Heat with Dwayne Wade came back and took it away. But in 2011, nobody could stop us. It was fantastic. I mean, they were just amazing. Dirk won the MVP. He, out of the 21 years he was a player, he won the All Star. He didn't win it. He was on the All Star team 14 out of the 21 years. That's amazing. MVP. He holds so many records. He holds a lot of, of Dallas as team records on, on the Mavericks. I mean, man, you stay anywhere for 21 years, you're going to chalk up a lot of records. Now, like I said, we're running a race. We're not playing, well, we could say we're playing spiritual basketball, but, you know, Paul compared it to running a race. We're in a marathon. And our goal is to cross the finish line one day and to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not to win an earthly prize. You know, the Bible says that, that prize right there that he's holding in his hand, it's really sweet right there at that time and moment. But guess what? That prize now is kind of like in the dustbin of history. Nobody ever goes up to Dirk Nowitzki in public and slaps him on the back. I couldn't even reach his back. But anyway, you don't slap him on the back and say, Way to go, MVP, Dirk. They don't even probably remember. Nine, nine out of ten people don't even remember he was the MVP that year. And they might not even remember they won. They should remember they won a championship. I believe that um, the owner of the Mavericks, Mark Cuban, is going to erect a beautiful statue of Dirk in front of the American Airlines Center. I think it's appropriate. I mean, he was with the same team his entire career. He didn't play. Well, let me just say this. When he was drafted, he was drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks, but immediately traded to the Mavericks, so he never played for a different team. So this morning, I want to say to you that if you want to be a spiritual <laughs> Dirk Nowitzki, if you want to be inducted into God's Hall of Fame as a dedicated follower of Christ, I want you to know this. I want you to know that you can do it. You can do it. Now, you have an enemy, the devil, but with God's help and with his strength, and if you obey God, you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, you, you practice, as it were, you get in the gym and practice, you can make an impact and so you can see Jesus and you can hear those things that you want to hear. You can get into God's Hall of Fame. So the title that I've given today for this message is this. I want to talk to you just two points today on the importance of you disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness, the importance of self-discipline. 
All right, let's bow our heads for prayer, and then we'll get right into this. Father, we thank you today for bringing us together as your people. I praise you for these godly people that want to bring you honor and glory, Lord. Week by week, they're here, week in and week out. And even sometimes they come when they're not really feeling that great because they do discipline themselves for the purpose of godliness. And so, Lord, we're here, and we just ask that your word would be mighty in our hearts, that the Holy Spirit of God would convict us, Lord, and would encourage us. And, Lord, may we leave her and say, Lord, thank you. That was so good. I needed that scripture. I needed the word of God. Thank you, Lord. And we pray it in your precious name and for your sake, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, for decades now, soft drink companies have run TV commercials, right? In order to get you to obey your thirst. <laughs> obey your thirst. Now, let me just tell you this. This is a commandment you don't want to obey, okay? Because that can of soda is like taking, I don't know, like a cup. You know, you know, ladies, when you're making dessert, you're making a dessert, you take a cup of sugar. <laughs> Essentially, that's what you're doing. You're drinking a cup of brain-numbing, body-destroying substance called sugar, and it's very high. Now, of course, to, to, today after the service, if you want me to, if you want to meet me on the side of the building, and have a, a fight over this, I'll be happy to meet you out there, all right? I'll put you in a headlock and say, kill the sugar before the sugar kills you. I'll do that. But sugar is good, and, but you know what? It's to be taken in moderation, but on TV they say, obey your thirst. If you're thirsty, just drink it all the time and drink it down, and that's really, really bad for you, your children. And, you know, that's what brings on diabetes and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, this is what they are always telling you. But God says, you know, there's something better. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now there's when you want to obey your thirst. If you're thirsting and hungering for righteousness, then quench that thirst by getting in God's word and growing strong. Now David was a disciplined follower of the Lord. The Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Yes, David failed. Yes, David messed up, and he committed adultery, and he had Uriah murdered. He really messed up when he did that. But guess what? That was a sliver of his life, and when you take his entire lifespan and look at the whole overall picture, everybody, David was a man after God's own heart. Man, did he, he's like Dirk Nowitzki was for basketball. Man, he wanted to know God. He so many times in the Psalms, Lord, I hunger and thirst for you. Like the deer is panting for the water brooks, I'm thirsting my soul. My life is thirsting after you, O oh God. Wow. Lord God, help us to be like David, to be thirsting and hungering, to glorify God and to know him. He was saying, Lord, I have to know you better. I'm like a man in the desert. I want to know you as much as a man in the desert wants to have a drink of water. Okay, so two lessons this morning. Two lessons about disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. Number one, okay, discipline involves determination. Discipline involves determination. Listen, Dirk Nowitzki didn't hold those awards he didn't win a championship for the Dallas Mavericks without in his heart somewhere along the way saying, look, God made me seven foot tall. I want it to count. Was that a good Arnold Schwarzenegger invitation? Okay, so anyway, I want to be the best. I want to pump you up. Anyway, so anyway, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that he had, he had determination. He says, you know what? I don't want to fail God. I don't want to, I don't want to go into eternity coasting. I want to be determined, and I want to know him, and I want to glorify him. Look at verse 8. This is so great. David said, my soul follows close behind you. That's Psalm 63, 8. And in, when you see the word soul, everybody, just remember that we're talking about our lives, Okay. Of course, it, sometimes it means innermost being, and that's fine, but really a soul is who we are, the, the real you and I and the innermost person. He's saying, you know, 
my inner person, Lord, follows close behind you. Now, I look this up. Very interesting. That word, follows close behind, is a word that means clings. In fact, sometimes it means glue. I'm glued. <laughs> Some places it could be meaning, have the meaning of glue. But it's clinging. Lord, my life clings to yours. That's how bad I need you, Lord. The same word in Hebrew is used in Genesis 2.24. A man, this is the wedding, a man leaving his wife, I'm sorry, leaving his father and mother to cling to his wife. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So what, what uh, marriage is to a man and woman in that oneness, in that unity, God says, I want that same desire, that same determination in your life and heart when it comes to me, my word, prayer. And again, by no means, everybody listen to me carefully. By no means do I mean that you have to pray three times a day. You know, David prayed, Daniel prayed three times a day, and I'm going to show you verses later where David said, in the morning you're going to hear my voice, and then at the daytime, and then in the evening I meditate on you. And by no means do we want to turn this into a legalistic thing. And by no means am I saying that, uh, you know, if, you, for, for instance, one day something happens and you get all discombobulated, there's an emergency and you got to run off to work or you got to go do this or something happens with the children or grandchildren and something crazy. And, you know, you were planning on drawing near to the Lord to read the Bible, to spend some time in prayer. You know what? When, when you make it legalistic and you just, you know, basically say, wow, if... If I don't do this every single day and maybe several times a day, I'm not right with God and that I'm disobeying God and all that. that that's going too far this way. But then to have the attitude like this, well, you know what? I don't ever read my Bible, but that's okay. Because, you know, God, he's very merciful. And I don't ever pray. Uh, or, or I use God as a spare tire. Okay, something goes haywire, and just like when you get a flat, you take the tire out, you, you use it every three or four years when you get a flat, but then you put it back in the trunk, you know, and Wednesday night I told the joke about this guy. I don't think that he was a Christian, he was a real believer, but he was driving around town one day, this businessman, and he had to get, he had to get a parking space because he had to be at this important meeting, Man, he's driving around the city, looking around, going around the block, around the block, trying to find a parking space, can't find one. So then he gets the brilliant idea, hey, maybe there's a God up in heaven, and if I pray and ask him, he'll give me a parking space. So he says, uh, uh, dear Lord, uh, um, he said, uh, if you'll give me a parking space, Lord, I promise you that I'll quit drinking and I promise you that I'll start going to church. All of a sudden, there was a parking space there. It appeared out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, as soon as he saw it, he looked up to God and said, Oh, never mind. Never mind. See, that's the way a lot of people use God. They're like a spare tire. They take them out when they need them and shove them back in the truck. Okay. So, over here you got... These that nearly never draw near to the Lord in a, in a special and meaningful way. And then you got people over here are saying, if you don't pray all day long and everything you do and think and everything, and by the way, that's good to do. But when I start putting it on you, which I've called this earlier in this series, I drive by guilting. You want to drive by guilting? Preachers are great at it. But anyway, but we guilt you and say, hey, listen, if this doesn't happen three times a day or six times a day or, you know, it can get a little dicey there spiritually. It's not, that's legalism. It's not the dynamic Christian life God wants us to have. God wants us, you know, there was an old song in the 70s. There was a band called Cheap Trick. You say, how do you remember Cheap Trick, Pastor Bob? Because I remember them because this other band came to my hometown called Bachman Turner Overdrive 
and they were real big and their music is still being used today by Office Depot and they use their famous song taking care of business every day taking care of business every way okay they use that on TV and that song's old well they were the headline band but this band that was brand new called Cheap Trick came in and stole the show and man they had guitar amplifiers that were like 20 feet in the air they had them all stacked up there and the guy put on something that lifted him up and he all of a sudden he was standing on top like way up there at the height of our ceiling in church and they had a spotlight on him and he's playing the guitar up there well of course all of us 17 year olds went bananas that guy up there well then when Bachman Turner Overdrive suddenly those 30 year old Bachman Turner Overdrive dudes they look like they were 70 and they're up there taking care of business and everybody's just sitting there nah nope and nobody clapped <laughs> they'd get done and like oh they're like oh this is not good so they did like three or four songs and then they got mad and they started cussing at everybody and they took off and they quit they didn't want to play anymore because nobody was being cool to them and clapping and everything but anyway um, you know when we as believers when we, oh, I didn't finish my story off. So Cheap Trick, <laughs> so Cheap Trick, so Cheap Trick had a song that says, I want you to want me. I need you to need me. I'm begging you to beg me. Okay? The idea behind that was, I mean business. I want you to want me. I need you to need me. Okay? It was a great, great song. And what I'm saying about that is this. You know what? God doesn't want this from you. Watch me, Lord. I'm opening my Bible. Aren't I good? And look at Lord. I'm kneeling now. I'm praying to you, Lord. Ooh, you, don't you love me, Lord? No, God, I mean, that's great, but God doesn't want you to do it just so you can check off your checklist. He wants you to want him. He wants you to have the inner idea of, Man, I want to sit on my pawpaw's lap. <laughs> Just like a little grandchild. You know, when our kids got back yesterday, I went to pick them up at the airport. Because now they got two children, two car seats, a stroller, two big bags of stuff. You know, they go on vacation, it's like they need a U-Haul. So I, I drove their van. I went to their house, picked up their van, went to the airport, got all their stuff, helped them, and... And you know what, when I came there, the grandkids weren't like, you know, oh, look, there's Pops. Hi. Okay. No, when they see you, they're excited. The kids are even more excited because they've been holding those kids for a week. And when they see you come, here you go, Pops, and you're holding both grandkids, and you love it, and they love it. Man, Nicole's like, woohoo. You know, she thought she died and went to heaven when I showed up. Of course, you know, they were packed, and, you know, they were on the plane for two hours holding them, or three hours holding them on their laps all the way back, and that, yeah, that can get old real quick, okay? So you get the idea. So that desire, that inward desire, there's nothing like it. And just like you love for your grandkids or your children to want you and to love you and to come, same thing with God. He wants it from the inside out, okay? All right. Now, Psalm 143, let me see. Is that on my next slide? Yes. Ooh, this is good. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you. Notice that inner desire. I thirst for you as parched land thirsts for rain. I thirst, Lord, I want, you know what, Lord, this word is kind of mysterious to me. It's kind of nebulous. It's kind of an enigma. I don't really understand this Bible, but I want to. And you know what? You don't want to just read words. You want to say, Lord, what do you mean by this? This is so, I can't get this, Lord. And you start hungering and thirsting, okay? Something happens to you on the inside out. You know, in his book, Too, not, too Busy Not to Pray, 
Bill Hybels wrote this. Authentic Christianity, and again, what he's talking about by authentic Christianity is like the kind that you want. You want it to be genuine, authentic. You want it to be significant. You want it to be awesome. You don't want it to be like, okay, I read my Bible. Okay, I prayed. Okay, I gave my offering. Okay, I hugged three people at church. Okay, okay. That's not cool. That's just like going through the motions, okay? God wants it to be awesome and real. Bill Hybel said, authentic Christianity is not learning a set of doctrines and then stepping in cadence like a robot, stepping in cadence with all the people and doing exactly what they want you to do, it marching in the same way. It is a walk. Now, don't Everybody, we need good doctrine, we need good teaching, but he's saying it's not just learning things and then just doing exactly like, in other words, he wants it to be a real relationship. Okay, what would a marriage be like if, man, right after your honeymoon you get back and the husband hands his wife a list of things and says, okay, honey, now I don't ever want to talk to you again. <laughs> And I don't ever want to be around you, but here's 10 things that you're going to do for me, and I want them done every day, and I even put the time I want you to do them. Now that we're married, or vice versa. If the wife gave the husband a list, honey, here's a list. Every day you're going to do these 10 things. At 7 o'clock in the evening, there will be dishes all over the counter, and many more in the sink. And every day at 7 o'clock, you will eradicate those. They will go away. They're going to go in the dishwasher, or they're going to be washed and put away. You get the idea? You would say, oh, that's a horrible relationship. Same thing if we, do, if we treat God that way. We want authentic Christianity. It is a walk. It's a lifestyle. A supernatural walk with a living, dynamic, communicating God. The arch enemy of spiritual authenticity is busyness, which is closely tied to something the Bible calls worldliness. Getting caught up with the society's agenda, objectives, or goals, and activities to the neglect of walking with God. Okay, what Bill Hybels is saying, hey, we're from a different planet. We're not citizens of this earth. We're citizens of heaven. We're God's people. We're from a different planet. We're, from, we're, we're to be weirdos down here. You do what? You say what? Yeah, we're to be different. We're to be a peculiar people, the old King James says. A peculiar people. Now, it doesn't mean weirdos in the sense that you, you know, you don't wear deodorant and you walk around people. Do I smell good? No. That would be weird. But what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that we're to be different in the sense that we don't run around like chickens with our heads cut off. We wake up Saturday morning and we begin this rat race where and then we go all day long, and they, listen, I know we got to work on things that we have to get taken care of, that we don't get taken care of during the week, but I'm just saying, is if our lives, if we're so busy we don't have time for God, no matter what day it's on, <laughs> you know, like, like I said earlier, if, if you never read the Bible, if you never pray, then I'm saying that something has to change. God is real, he's a person, and he wants to communicate with us, and he wants us to walk with him. You know, David didn't say, one day when things are better, I'll start connecting with God. He didn't say, if it happens, great. No, we're talking about discipline involves determination. Dirk Nowitzki didn't say, well, if I can hit three pointers, great, but I'm not going to practice. Man, if I can hit free throws, love it, but I'm not going to practice shooting free throws. His coach helped to show him how when he shot, he's one of the best, if not the best, big man shooters. I mean, a guy that's seven foot tall. Normally, if you're seven foot tall, you hit like one out of ten baskets. 
you can't shoot very well. You can block them. Huh. You stick your arm up and it's like 18 feet in the air and you can block it. But you know what, Dirk perfected where you could fall back on those fadeaway shots. He would go up and then he would fade way back and nobody could block his shot because he's so tall and then he's fading way back and they can't reach the ball and he would just throw it right over him and it would switch. He was unbelievable. And you know, even though David was a king over an entire nation, think about that, he was running an entire nation, he kept his priorities straight. God first, everything else second, and he was determined to keep it that way. All right? Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Why is it good to do that? Here's why. For they shall be filled. And that word means satisfied. If you were to think of this as food, in fact, that word is used, filled is used as a word for a person that gets full of food. Our physical body, our physical body wants to fill, be filled up with food, but you know what, inwardly we want to be filled up with God and his word. You will be satisfied. You'll get filled up and you'll just, you'll just say, this is great. It's just like after Thanksgiving, as long as you don't eat too much, sometimes you're like, oh, because you ate too much, okay? <laughs> and you know, you burp and the last thing you ate was like a big mouthful of jalapenos and so there's steam coming out of your ears when you burp. That's not good. That's not too, that's too filled. But with this, there's so many times where you've eaten, like, like, man, if you took your wife out or girlfriend for a big, beautiful steak one night and it was at a really fancy place, oh, there's nothing like it. And you finish it and you're just like, oh, I died and went to heaven. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. Well, God wants you to know that the same way, spiritually. You know, uh, s several years ago, I would say like in 2011, 2012, Bill McCartney, who was the former head football coach at the University of Colorado, I had the honor of meeting him and getting a picture with him after he spoke in Dallas at a pastor's conference. It's really an honor. Of course, this was like, this picture is from like 1975. So now he's elderly, but he's still a fire in the pulpit. Man, he is on fire. And he really got to the hearts of the pastors there. But anyway, he told this following story, and I want to read this to you real quickly. When I took the job as head football coach in 1982, I made a solemn promise. I told everybody that with me, God was first, family second, and football third. But I didn't keep that promise very long. The thrill and the challenge of resurrecting a football program in disarray simply took too much time and attention. As my teams kept winning and winning year after year, I kept losing focus of my priorities. When we won the national championship in 1990, many people said I had reached the pinnacle of my profession. But for me, there was an emptiness about it. This is what he said. I had everything a man could want, and yet something was missing. I was so busy pursuing my career goals that I was missing out on the spirit-filled life that God wanted me to have. All because I had broken my promise to God to put God first and foremost in my life. You know, Bill McCartney won a national championship. There's a lot of college teams, and there's a lot of coaches that they've coached their entire lives and never get close to that. He won it, but because he had benched God. You know what it means to get benched, okay? To get benched means you used to be on the starting team, and you were on the football field playing, or you were on the baseball field, or so on and so forth, whatever sport, but the coach said, you're not doing very well, go sit the bench. Bill McCartney, what he did, he made a promise. God first, family second, football third. And you know what? He immediately turned it around. Football first, family second, God third. And what happened was he benched God. God, don't need you. You can go over there and sit on the bench. You're my spare tire, God. Go, go over there. Okay? Look what Jeremiah said to God's people. 
This is God speaking through Jeremiah, but these, this, these are the words of God. My people, Jeremiah, have done two evil things. Notice, evil. They have forsaken me. They've benched me. The fountain of living water. You know, this morning when we sang, there is a river. That's Jesus. He's the river. He's the river. If we don't get in that water, we're not going to be, our thirst isn't going to be quenched. Our soul isn't going to be satisfied. We're going to keep living on this earth, but never have satisfaction. Oh, I wish I was rich. Oh, I wish that I, oh, I wish that I, oh, I wish that I, and you'll never be satisfied. You'll walk around from wishing for one thing after another instead of sitting down and saying, wow, I'm the most blessed person on the earth. I'm God's child. I've got a wonderful family. I've got a wonderful church family. I've got friends. God's good to me. Let's give God thanks. Amen. I drive, I drive in a car that goes down the road, and it has an air conditioner in it that keeps me from, from melting in the Dallas heat. And then sometimes I'm able to get on this thing called a jet. It's a magic carpet. And I sit. I sit on this jet. I'm sitting on a magic carpet. That's 30,000 feet in the air. And I'm riding this magic carpet from Dallas all the way to New York. And I'm just sitting there 30,000 feet on this magic carpet. And it gets me there in three or four hours. You know, people used to take a, take a, a, a horse and a buggy across America, and they went from New York to Los Angeles, and it took their whole lives to get there, and half of them croaked on the way. And we have so many blessings. And you know what? God wants us to be satisfied. He wants us to be satisfied. My people have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns. That's a well. Cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, the cisterns might have been a vessel, but typically a lot of times cisterns were wells that were dug. But the, Doug, but the bottom line is they couldn't hold water, okay? And that's what we do when we're too busy for God, when we're not disciplined, when something always pushes God aside. And listen, I, don't, I understand sometimes it happens, and you just have to do it. But I'm, my, my problem is, is with believers that push them aside for weeks and months and years. And that's what we got to be careful about. Okay, number one, dis dis uh, discipline involves determination. But how else can we be like a spiritual Dirk Nowitzki? How else can we be like what he did in basketball? How can we do that for God? Well, time. You know, when he practiced with his coach Holger, he didn't say, hey, Coach Holger, can you come and you practice with me 10 minutes? No. No, he said, no, I'm not coming for 10 minutes. I'll come for an hour, I'll come for two hours. I'm not coming for 10 minutes because that's not going to cut the mustard, okay? You know, many years ago, John Ortberg, he's a, a pastor in California now, but he was a pastor outside a massive church in the Chicago area years ago, and he told the following story when he was just getting, his, uh, getting started there in that Chicago area, and it was really busy and crazy there in Chicago. And so he asked his friend, a wise friend, to meet him. He said this, this is what Ortberg said, Not long after moving to Chicago, I called a wise friend to ask for some spiritual direction. I described the pace of my life and current ministry of the church, where I serve tends to move at a fast clip. I also told him about our family life. We're a dra dra van driving, soccer league, piano lesson. We're in those years in our life. I told him about the present condition of my heart as best I could. Then I asked him this question. What do I need to what do I need to do to be spiritually healthy? What do I need to do to be spiritually healthy? Well, there's a long pause. And his friend that's sitting across from him says this. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. See, he just got done telling him, I'm already running like a crazy man. He says, if you keep doing that, you're going to be worthless to those people at that church. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. 
Hey, by the way, can I say this off the cup? I'll come back to the story. I try to get to bed at a decent hour. I get up really early. And you know why I do that? Because when I can get up early and walk and pray and interact with God, there's no texts coming to my phone. There's no calls coming into my phone. Nothing like that. The house phone isn't ringing. People aren't ringing the doorbell. Nothing like that. You know what it is? I've just got a half an hour or an hour, whatever time I have, to say, Lord, it's just you and me. Just you and me. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, but just you and me. Just me and God. And it's so wonderful. I can't tell you how wonderful it is. You know why? Because I'm not rushed. I'm not like, oh, I gotta, I gotta hurry and pray. I gotta hurry and pray because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to pray. No, I don't have to feel like that. Now, if I wait till 9 a.m. to do that, it'll get that way. If I come up here to the church, even if I go here in the foyer where I'm away from the office, if I go over here and it's just me in an empty church building, and I try to pray, what's happening? I've got to get this done, I've got to get this done, I've got to get this done. But you know what? By getting up, by disciplining, and getting, being able to set apart the time. Now, for you, you may want to do this late at the night, though I do know it's harder when you're tired at the end of the day to really think more clearly. But what's best for you is best for you. You might be a night owl. It might be best for you to do it at night, and do it from, say, 11 till midnight, and then go to bed and get up an hour later than I do. Okay? But you get the idea. And again, by the way, I don't say every single morning. Some mornings I'll just say, hey, Lord, you know what? I'm really tired this morning, so I'm not going to get up at 521 <laughs> or whatever, you know. Okay, so going back to John Ortberg, but I just wanted to say that for this reason, not to show off or anything like that. I just wanted to say that because it's wonderful. When you can get rid of that hurry, hurriness and your busyness, it just is like so liberating. It's just amazing. Okay. So, anyway, so here's what happened to Ortberg after his wise friend gave him this advice. He wrote it down, and he said, okay, I've written that one down. Uh, he said, I wrote that down. I told I was a little bit impatient. He said, that's a good one. Now, what else is there? He said, I had a lot to do, so I was anxious to cram as many units of spiritual wisdom into the least amount of time possible. Another long pause. His friend said this, there is nothing else. And again, he's talking, he's talking, he's not talking in an absolute sense. Of course there's things other than getting rid of business. But he's just saying, if you don't do this, you'll never get to those things, okay? He's not talking absolutely here. He said, what else is there? He says, there is nothing else. This right here is crucial. This is it. You gotta get the, in, 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 there's, in a sense, he's right. He says, there is nothing else. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So John Arberg left this discussion, and, you know, went his way, and he was reflecting on his interaction with his friend, and he said this, I've concluded that my life in the well-being of the people I serve depends on following his prescription. For, for hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. Hurry destroys souls. Okay? So again, everybody, please hear what I'm saying. You, God is your father. I'm not your God. Now, I, do ta I tell you things God says, but I'm not your God. And you don't have to do the Christian life the way I say, as far as like when you're going to pray, when you're going to read the Bible, so on and so forth, how often you should do it. Hey, I think that in the position I am in, I should be in the Bible and praying a lot more than other people. Okay, I think that that's probably appropriate. But what I'm saying is this. I'm just saying for all of you, if you're going to hear well done, good and faithful servant, you're going to have to somehow, some way, get connected to God in an authentic and and life transforming way where it's really made you don't just read that and say I didn't understand any of that by the way if that happens to you a lot here's what I suggest get a yellow highlighter or get a red ink pen 
And as you're reading the Bible, you're reading some things that you just don't get. But when you get to that line that you do get, like how, how hard is it to understand, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. How hard is it to understand that? Well, you ought to underline everything you understand. And then when you get done reading, just sit there and go back and think about those things. Wow, Lord, you said, the person who has your blessings is a merciful person. Lord, a lot of times I'm not merciful at all, Lord. <laughs> I'm really mean and ornery to people. I want my way. And so anyway, when that starts happening, everybody, man, then you're on the road. And you can do it. Like I said earlier today, God didn't make hearing well done, good and faithful servant one day un unattainable. You can attain it, but it does take determination, it does take discipline, it does take time. That's a given, okay? I've concluded, Ortberg said, that my life and the well-being of the people I serve de depends on following his prescription because hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. Hurry destroys souls. Dirk Nowitzki took time to practice. He took time to learn from his coach. It's what made him great. In the same way, you need to take time for your coach, capital C. Now again, not coach purse, ladies. Coach, like coaching you spiritually, okay? Interact with him. Allow him to give you tips how you can improve. You got to eliminate hurry and take time for him, okay? Now, Real quickly here, did I even put these in? Yeah, I put these in. And by the way, I put this here. If you're going to bench Jesus, sit on the bench with him, okay? All right? He wants to have a relationship that's authentic. He wants a relationship where you're connecting, all right? Real quickly here, we won't take time at all for these, because I don't want you to look at this legal, legalistically, like, oh, I got to do it in the morning, and then I got to do it at lunch, and then I got to do it at night. No, no, that's not why he said these things. By saying it this way, he was just saying, man, David was determined. Look at David did it in the morning. Lord, in the morning, my voice you'll hear in the morning. He did it in the middle of the day. I'll bless you while I live, while I'm up. Not when I'm dead. I'm going to do it in this lifetime, and I'm going to do it why not, while I'm alive emotionally and physically throughout the day. And then in the evening, I'll meditate on you at night. So what he's saying, he's not saying, okay, you need to do it like this and do exactly what David did. No, he's saying David, David was determined. He took time for God. Look, he did it throughout the day. And by the way, I don't have any problem with you getting, if you get in the car and you start praying on the way to work, and then at lunchtime when you pray, you take a few minutes to pray to God then, and then maybe in the middle of the day you have decisions to make and you pray to God then, and then when you get in your car to go home, you lift up more prayer to God. Hey, just, just let him be your friend. Say, oh, Lord, I'm done with work, and I, I was, thank you for this day. I'm so glad just to be with you here on this drive home for a few minutes. Oh, Lord, I love you. Just start, just start treating them like your best friend. It'll transform your life, everybody. Okay, I'm going to close with the final story. I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Richard Allen Farmer at the Moody Pastors Conference many years ago. He's a lot younger than In fact, he's in his 60s now. This is when he was in his 40s maybe even in his late 30s. No, it was when he was in his 40s. He was like 43 or something like that. But anyway, Richard Allen Farmer, he's not only a tremendous pastor, he's a tremendous piano player. He's like a virtuoso on the piano. He said this at the conference that I went to. He said, I have a 95-year-old grandmother. He said, no one has heard me preach more than three times without hearing a story about my grandmama. That's what he called her, grandmama. The saddest thing I can probably say about you is that you'll never get a chance to meet Sweetie Pie. You'll never get a chance. She lives in New York City, and we are extremely close. I am the second born of her 65-year-old daughter, and she makes me happy. We'll talk, we, we talk on the phone every Sunday night. 
no matter where we, uh, no matter where I am in the world, when I talk to her, or when I see her, as I will next week, it's not it's not drudgery for me to enjoy her presence. Over these last 43 years, I have simply bathed in the sunlight of her presence. I don't say, oh, I've got to go see my grandmother. It's, I get to see Sweetie Pie. Now Dr. Farmer made the application. He said, he's talking to preachers, the psalmist says, it ought to be your delight to come up into Papa's face and enjoy his presence. It presupposes a relationship that makes you want to be there. It presupposes a relationship that makes you want to be there. Folks, that's what I want for you. Right now, you're here, or you're here, or you're here. But you know what? Including myself, we all, we all could be here, or here, or here, when it comes to our walk with God. And you know what? Today, if you'll just say, Lord, I'm right here right now, Lord. If you could help me get here, that'll be wonderful. Because, Lord, if you can help me get here, you're my coach, and you can give me tips and helps and encouragements. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You remember the piano story I told you where the guy was playing chopsticks? Don't quit. Keep going. You're doing fine. And the master was playing the piano. Okay, God's our coach. He's encouraging us. And you get here, and guess what will happen? God will move you here. All right? So you stay at it. The just person falls seven times, but he gets back up again. <laughs> Get back up. Oh, Lord, I put you in the trunk for two weeks. I'm sorry. Get him out. He'll say, okay, no problem. Keep going. You got it? So don't give up. Just like Richard Allen Farmer took time to call and to bask in the love of his grandma, every one of us, need to take time and let our Heavenly Father wrap his arms around us, as it were. Obviously, he doesn't have arms, but you get the idea. To draw you close, like you're his grandchild or his child, and he's just telling you how much he... You know, when you read the Bible, you get to learn about God, and you realize how much he really loves you and why it's worth serving him. Let him do that. Let him whisper in your ear, just like the great... Pavluski did in the ear of that little boy that was playing chopsticks. Remember I told you in the first message two weeks ago, keep going, child. Keep going, child. I'm here. You're doing great. Keep on going. Don't quit. So how do we apply this, everybody? How do we apply this? It's easy. How do we take this home? How do we put it to use? Easy. Determination and time. Today, in your heart, what you have to tell God is something along the lines of, Lord, I'm not happy with where I'm at. I know you. I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. And by the way, if you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven, you need to come and see me. Because if Jesus returns today or tomorrow, you're not going up with him. <laughs> You're going to be left behind down here and have to do a lot of suffering. And even worse than that, if you get killed in a car wreck or something or you have a heart attack, you won't be with them for eternity. So you need to see me after church and say, hey, Pastor Bob, I need to talk to you. I need to nail this down so I know that I'm going to heaven. Okay, you got that? If you're not sure, or even if you're just doubting, say, I was sure, but I'm not sure now. I got all discombobulated. I can help you with that. Either way, you need to see me and let me help you. But if you already know you're saved and you know you've been up and down, you know, you've been all over the map, you know, it's not like a steady relationship with God. Man, you're on fire, then you're down here in the ditch, and you're on fire, and then you're all cold and... 
you're up and down, and it's all, okay, you know what, start today and say, Lord, I determine by your grace to really know you, for it to be authentic and wonderful, and to grow and to make progress, and other people will see my progress and glorify you, Lord. So you need determination. Are you determined for a relationship with God like that? If not, why not? And then secondly, before we pray, time. The next question God asks you, will you make time for me? You figure out what's best for you. What's best for Pastor Bob may not be best for you, but you figure out what's best for you where you will say, yeah, you know what? Definitely on this day and at this time, man, that's going to be my time. Or it might be every day. Maybe, maybe you'll have... Maybe, in, in a, let's say in the space of a week, maybe you'll have three long times with God, or maybe you'll have six shorter times with God, but what I'm saying is, get with your coach. Don't put them on the bench. Don't put them in the trunk. Get with them. And you know what Jesus says, those who seek me will what? Find me if they'll seek for me with all their heart. He'll find them. He'll find you too. And you'll just... You'll just be amazed. You say, how do you know, Pastor? How do you know? Well, the Bible says so, number one. And number two, you're looking at a living example. Because, folks, I was the chief of sinners, okay? <laughs> I was the chief of sinners. And God transformed me. He transformed me. Okay? And he'll do that for you. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads for just a moment. Okay, think about it, everybody. Determination. This morning, this morning, will you say, hey, I'm determined. I'm determined. I'm definitely going to do better. I definitely want to know God. Just tell the Lord that right now. Say, Lord, forgive me for turning you into a spare tire. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I've really messed up. And secondly, time. When will you draw near to God? Where, when will you do that? When will you do that? Father, we praise you for this little mini-series. It was only three weeks, but what a great way to start the fall off, Lord. Lord, we pray for our church family. There's some that are ill, Lord, and not doing well. We pray for our upcoming fall session in our small groups, Lord, in our life groups, Lord. Next week, we're going to kick that off, Lord. In seven days, Lord, we'll be getting ready to launch into these small groups. And Lord, how we pray that you'll use those. And Lord, as a church, we also pray that new members will begin to come to our church because they find friends in our small groups. Please, Lord, help them to prosper by your power. And then finally, Lord, we pray for us as your children and us as your followers. Lord, give us strength to discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness. Give us strength, give us grace, Lord. We beg you for it, Lord. And bless every person here today, Lord. They took the time. Now may they go home refreshed, and invigorated by your word. And we pray these things in your precious name, Lord, and for your sake.